We do sponsor the Green Party uh, until COVID came into place. Uh, we've normally sponsored some kind of event to stimulate public discussion and public awareness about political issues and public interest issues. And we've done this for years. Uh, this is our first attempt at a, um, at a uh, virtual you know, event. And uh, we normally meet at the Peace Center in Seaside, uh, but this is the first one not in that location. Uh, we're kind of everywhere tonight. <laughs> Uh, but uh, I, I did want to say that the Green Party does do this with some regularity, and uh, we hope we can continue to do some public interest issues in the future uh, uh, via Zoom. And uh, so this is the first attempt, and so we're all experimenting with this tonight, and I'm, uh, I'm, I'm comfortable that it's going to go well. Um, we're lucky to have uh, Mike Clancy with us tonight. Uh, he's got uh, some real technical uh, knowledge and so on, and I'm going to give a short introduction here. Uh, about the subject matter. While governments of the world struggle to deal with climate change, they also find themselves in the grip of a global pandemic. <clears throat> uh, economic fallout from COVID-19 pandemic has produced the largest drop in global energy demand. That's interesting. Since the Great Depression in the 1930s. This is what uh, Mike is gonna talk about. Is the resulting fallout from the CO2 emissions caused ultimately by the pandemic? And is it a silver lining? It will help change uh, the world and mitigate climate change and achieve the goals of the climate, Paris Climate Accord? We don't know. In this presentation, Mike, Mike Clancy, uh, will review the relevant climate science, discuss the consequences of the climate change we are experiencing, explore the impact of COVID-19 on the economic slowdown and that relationship to climate change, and we'll, uh, obviously lead a discussion on this. Uh, Mike is a former technical and scientific director of the Fleet Numerical Meteorology, Meteorology and Oceanography Center in Monterey. That's the famous fleet, fleet center that's in Monterey. That's the, that kind of the technical center of the world, as far as I'm concerned. Um, but and he's a member of the Citizens Climate Lobby. And he's a frequent public speaker on climate change. So we hope you enjoy his presentation and hope you interact with him on questions and so on. And we welcome you, Mike. So I'm going to turn it over to you, Mike. Thank you very much, George. I really appreciate you uh, setting this up for me. I also appreciate uh, Audra Walton for uh, the technical support on this issue. Um, I tend to talk pretty fast, and I tend to move pretty fast. Uh, and I'm going to be covering a lot of technical material tonight. As usual, my talk is going to be heavy on science. So don't hesitate to interrupt me if you can't figure out what I'm talking about. You know, I want to make sure everybody understands what I'm showing you on the screen. Um, some of the plots and charts I had are a little bit technical and complicated. If you don't know what the heck you're looking at, please interrupt me. I think there's a way to raise your hand. If not, unmute. If you can't get my attention, unmute and, and speak up and stop me. Um, we will have a Q&A session. Hopefully I can get through the technical part in about an hour. That should leave plenty of time for Q&A at the end, and I really enjoy the Q&A part. So. That'll be good. I'm going to now share my screen. And until we get to the Q&A part, I'm pretty much going to be on slides from that point on. So let's uh, hang in here and <laughs> uh, so let's see, uh, share. Okay. Uh, all right. I'm going to be bringing up my slides here. And on the right-hand side, you may see um, uh, the other participants. If you go to the very top of that, you can click on uh, the little bar there, which would allow, um, you know, would make uh, those that picture go away, and then you'll see my, my full slides. And that's something you may want to do because you're going to want to see uh, my full slides here. So I'm going to do that right now. And um, here's a quick outline of what we're going to be talking about tonight. Start with introduction and context. A lot of science there. Then I'm going to talk about the greenhouse effect. I'm sure you're aware of the greenhouse effect, but I'm going to talk about it in a little more technical detail than you're probably used to. I'll talk about the greenhouse gases, show the uh, projections for global warming to the end of the century, talk about the consequences, and then talk about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic, uh, in particular, the economic slowdown and the impact on emissions and what that might mean for climate change, closing comments, and then finally, of course, we'll have a Q&A thing. So let's jump right in on introduction and context. Could you, could you go back to the very first slide, if you would? Yes. My Hang title on. slide? Yeah, there you go. Okay, thank you. Taking a picture, okay. 
And um, so here we are looking at global mean surface temperature of the Earth over the past 5 million years. So 5 million years ago to the present, global mean surface temperature of the Earth. Now, global mean implies average over the entire face of the Earth, North Pole, to South Pole, all around, all around the Earth. Surface temperature means over the ocean, the sea surface temperature. Over the land and over the ice, it means temperature a few meters above the surface. And when you define it in that way, this is what that looks like. And beginning about two and a half million years ago, with the what's called the Pleistocene epoch, the Earth entered into ice age cycles. For the first uh, million and a half years, the Earth experienced a 40,000 year ice age cycle. And for about the past million years, the Earth has been experiencing a 100,000 year ice age cycle. Now, why am I talking about ice ages? Well, the climate change we're experiencing now, the, net, the, the climate change that we're concerned about, since, we've, since the Industrial Revolution, the past hundred years or so, that climate change is occurring against a backdrop of natural climate change. And for the past couple of million years, the ice age cycle has dominated natural climate change. So we need to understand the ice age cycle. We need to understand natural climate change, understand the anthropogenic or produced by man climate change that we are concerned with. Because after all, the ice age cycle produces large swings. From the warm spikes here to the cold excursions, the warm periods are called interglacial periods. The cold uh, periods are called glacial periods, but I'm gonna use the popular term of ice age to indicate these cold periods. And the swing in temperature there is about four to six degrees centigrade in global mean surface temperature of the earth. The global warming we're all concerned about has only been about one degree. So you can see that ice age cycle is really quite large. And again, it has really dominated natural climate change for the last couple of million years. So the question on the table is, do we understand the ice age cycle? And the answer is absolutely we do. In fact, we've understood it for about a hundred years. The ice age cycle is driven by variations in the Earth's orbit around the sun and variations in the Earth's orientation in space. And that derives the ice age cycle. Now, I'm sure you know that the Earth orbits the sun in an ellipse. Uh, it's kind of a drawn out circle such that in the Northern Hemisphere summer, the Earth is farther away from the sun than it is in Northern Hemisphere winter. That's really good for us, we people who live in the Northern Hemisphere. It makes our summers cooler and our winters warmer. But what you probably may not know is that that ellipse is not constant in time. It actually fluctuates on a 100,000 year period it goes from being more like an ellipse, more drawn out to more like a circle. Now this is highly exaggerated here. The actual variation is only about 1%, but that's enough to have a profound impact on climate. And that, it's called the eccentricity cycle. That 100,000 year eccentricity cycle is driven by the gravitational force of Jupiter and Saturn acting on the earth. I'm also sure you understand that the earth's axis is tilted. After all, that's what gives us the, the seasons. In Northern Hemisphere summer, the North Pole is tilted toward the sun. In Northern Hemisphere winter, the North Pole is tilted away from the sun. But what you may not know is that tilt is not constant in time. The Earth rocks back and forth from about 24.5 degrees inclination relative to the plane in which it orbits around the sun to about 22.5 degrees. Right now, we're about midway through the cycle. And that's a 41,000 year cycle driven by the gravitational force of the sun and the moon acting on the Earth. And finally, I'm sure you're aware that there is a North Star, that North Star is called Polaris. But what you may not know is the Earth's orbit wobbles. The Earth's rotation or axis wobbles on a 27,000 year period, such that 13,500 years from now, it won't be Polaris as a North Star, it'll be Vega as a North Star. And then 13,500 years later, it'll wobble back to Polaris. So these variations are going on. And this one again is called by, caused by the gravitational force of the sun and the moon acting on the earth, and the fact that the earth is top heavy. There's more land mass in the northern hemisphere than in the southern hemisphere, so the earth is not a perfectly balanced sphere. Now we've understood for about 100 years that the ice age cycle is driven by these orbital variations, and collectively they're referred to as the Milankovitch cycles, Milankovitch cycles, named after uh, a Serbian astronomer and um, geophysicist who figured this out back in the 1920s, 100 years ago, Milutin Milankovic, and that is in fact what drives the ice age, ice age cycle, and it works like this. Uh, when these orbital variations conspire to decrease solar radiation striking the Earth in the northern hemisphere summer, that takes us into an ice age. 
Now, that's the forcing that drives us into the ice age, but that forcing is amplified by three feedback effects, snow ice feedback, water vapor feedback, CO2 feedback. I'm going to talk about those in more detail later on, so I'm not going to, not going to belabor it now, but the point is it's these orbital variations that drive the ice age cycle, but these feedback loops here involving ice, water vapor, CO2, they amplify it. And it works the other way around. When increasing acceleration is striking the Earth during the Northern Hemisphere summer, that yields recovery from an ice age. And these feedback loops just operate in the, in the other direction and they amplify the warming, which takes us out of, out, of the, um, out of the ice age. Why is it Northern Hemisphere summer? Why not Southern Hemisphere summer? What's special about the Northern Hemisphere? Well, it's because the snow ice feedback effect operates most strongly in the Northern Hemisphere summer for two reasons. One, there's a lot more land in the Northern Hemisphere, so there's a lot, lot, a lot more snow on the ground, a lot more ground in the Northern Hemisphere. So that melting snow uh, participates or contributes to the snow ice feedback. But also at the North Pole, there's an ocean. It's the Arctic Ocean. South Pole, there's a continent, Antarctica. And uh, when the ice melts, it leaves behind dark ocean, and that amplifies the snow ice feedback effect. So the snow ice feedback effect works much more strongly in the Northern Hemisphere than in the Southern Hemisphere. And that's why Northern Hemisphere summer is the key, the key thing. Now, we're gonna zoom in once again. This was the five million year look of global mean surface temperature of the earth. We're gonna zoom now in way over here to look back just 22,000 years. And it looks like this. So this dip right here is in fact the last ice age. And this warming trend here is a recovery from the ice age driven by the eccentricity cycle. So what this means is the Earth's orbit around the sun was becoming less like an ellipse and more like a circle. So in Northern Hemisphere summer, the Earth was drawing closer to the sun. That was causing this warming trend. And that, that brought us to uh, what's called the, the Holocene warm period, which is where we are living today. In fact, for a point of reference, human, symbols, human civilization began about here, about 9,000 years ago right about here. And pretty much uh, all of our experience of art, literature, religion, science has been in, in this period right here since the beginning, beginning of human civilization. Now, during this period, there was a cooling trend. Cooling trend driven by the obliquity cycle. So what's happened here is that for the last 7,000 years, the earth has been um, losing tilt. The earth has been losing tilt and that produces a slow, in fact, the Earth has lost about seven-tenths of a degree of angular tilt over the last 7,000 years. And that has led to this slow cooling trend, which is headed towards the next ice age in about 8,000 years. The way these ice ages work is they, you're in the ice age for about 60,000 years. It takes about 10,000 years to come out. You're in the warm period for about 20,000 years, and then it takes about 10,000 years to go into the next ice age. So we're headed towards the next ice age about 8,000 years from now. A couple of other uh, identifiable things here. There's about a 1,500 year interruption in the ice age uh, warming here. It's called the Younger and Older Dryas period. Dryas is named after a type of flower, which was common when in Europe during this, this era right here. It flourished in this temperature range. Um, and there's also, you may have heard of the medieval warm period. This happened between uh, about 900 and 1200 AD. That was a period where the earth was slightly warmer, driven mainly because mainly by, um, by uh, the effect of, of the sun burning brighter, uh, the sunspots being more prevalent, sun burning brighter, uh, little volcanic activity to reflect the sunlight away and that produced a slight warming effect. This is called the Little Ice Age. Uh, it wasn't Ice Age at all, but it was a period of cool temperatures, particularly in Europe, most famously the River Thames froze over. And this happened between 1500 and 1700. And then finally, we come to this red spike, which is the post-industrial global warming. Now, there are two things that are very obvious when you look at this, pl this plot here. The first is this warming is going in the wrong direction. We should be in a cooling trend. We've been cooling the last 7,000 years with a few minor variations, but generally speaking, we should be cooling headed towards the next ice age, but suddenly there's this rapid increase in temperature. And in fact, it is indeed very rapid. In fact, this warming is, been, is, is occurring at a rate that's about 20 times faster, 20 times faster than natural climate change. This is natural climate change right here. 
this is 20 times too fast going in the wrong direction. Now, a lot of you heard my talks before. I've heard this before, so you know, bear with me, but maybe some people haven't heard it. It'll be funny to them. What does 20 times too fast in the wrong direction mean? Well, let's assume you're a golfer and you're playing golf at Quail Lodge. And unfortunately, you take a wrong turn in your golf cart and you find yourself westbound on Carmel Valley Road. And unfortunately, it's car week. And suddenly, you encounter a Lamborghini going the other direction, 200 miles an hour. You're puttering along at 10 miles an hour. Here comes a Lamborghini at 200 miles an hour. Now, this is not that far out of a possibility because I can assure you during car week, Lamborghinis occasionally do drive 200 miles an hour on Carmel Valley Road as long as the cops aren't around. It does happen. So the point is, if natural climate change is, is the golf cart, what we have been experiencing for the last 100 years is the Lamborghini. Now, you would never confuse a Lamborghini with a golf cart, and you should never confuse this global warming with natural climate change. It is not natural climate change. 20 times too fast and in the wrong direction. Now we're gonna zoom in once again. Now we're looking back um, about 150 years or so, 1850 to 2017, looking at the same thing we've been looking at all along, global mean surface temperature of the earth in degrees centigrade. But now we're looking at it from five different sources, the Japanese Meteorological Agency, the Europeans, the UK Met Office, two uh, US products, a NASA product and a NOAA product, I won't go into detail on these products, but some of them involve computer models, some of them don't, some involve satellite data, others don't. Um, some involve only surface data. All of them involves different ways of processing data, different data sets, different quality control, different gridding, all of that. But the point is these five independent analyses produced by five independent groups, five independent data sets, all paint the same picture. And that picture is as follows. From 1850 to 1880, not too much happening. From 1880 to 1910, a slight decline. 1910 to 1945, a fairly rapid increase. 1945 to 1975, kind of going sideways, maybe a slight decline. And then beginning in the 1970s, from mid-70s to the current time, a very rapid uh, rise in temperature, such that we are now about 1.2 degrees centigrade above the pre-industrial level. Pre-industrial level is usually defined as 1850 to 1900 average. Now, a couple of things about this. First of all, notice in the modern era here how closely these five independent products agree. And that's because we have a very good handle on global warming. Uh, it's very well observed by the meteorological and ocean observing systems out there. And um, we, have it, we have it very well understood. Notice that it doesn't go up in a straight line. It's kind of like the stock market. The stock market doesn't go up in a straight line. There's some volatility here. Global mean surface center of the earth doesn't go up in a straight line. There's these ups and downs. This is called climate variability. There's climate change, which occurs on time scales or time frames longer than 30 years. Then there's climate variability, which happens from months to decades. And that involves things like El Nino and La Nina, which of course we're very familiar with here in California. Um, the IOD, the Indian Ocean Dipole, which is the Indian Ocean equivalent of El Nino, the Atlantic Multidecadal Oscillation. There are these things that go on that move heat around. They happen on timescales of months to decades. That's not climate change. That's climate variability. Climate change is a long-term trend here. What climate deniers often do is say, hey, look, global warming is over. Cooled right here, but they forget about that part. Oh, global warming is over. Oh, global warming is over. Oh, global warming is over. Global warming is over. What do you know? Global warming is over and they ignore the long-term trend. What we are really concerned about is the long-term trend here, 30 years or longer. Now I'm gonna show an animation of one of these. I'm gonna show an animation of, in fact, the NASA surface product. And what we're gonna be looking at now across the face of the earth is gonna be surface temperature anomaly from 1880 to 2018. Now, um, whoops, go back one here. Surface temperature anomaly. Now, temperature anomaly, that's just a fancy way of saying temperature difference. Temperature difference from a reference field. And in fact, the reference field that we're going to be using here is going to be the 1951 to 1980 average of the temperature all, the way, all across the face of the Earth. And the temperature scale is shown right here. So where it's white, any place in the Earth where it's white in this animation, it means the temperature is the same as the 1951 to uh, 
1980 average in that particular location. Where it's yellow or orange, it's warmer. And or a dark orange means two degrees centigrade warmer. Where it's blue to dark blue, it's cooler. And the darkest blue means two degrees uh, centigrade cooler. And um, so I'm gonna roll this animation, but first let me talk a little bit more about the data. Uh, you might be concerned about computer models. Don't trust computer models. Don't worry about it. There's no computer models in this. You might be a little worried about satellite data. Satellite data is kind of tricky, particularly for uh, extracting climate information. Uh, don't worry about it. There's no satellite data here. You might have heard about the uh, urban heat island effect, which is a real effect. Uh, that's it, that's uh, cities, uh, because all the concrete and buildings and so forth, they're, they're warmer than surrounding countryside. Don't worry about it. About 300 stations were deemed to be contaminated by the urban heat. In fact, they've been removed from this analysis. Uh, there's a lot of data here. Over the ocean, about 350 million observations during this time frame, mainly from ships, but in recent years, uh, also drifting buoys. About, uh, actually, uh, about 2 billion observations over land, about 26,000 land stations reporting temperatures over this 100 year period or more. Uh, results in you know, several billion observations over land. So lots of data out there. You might be aware of that um, before uh, in the first half of the 20th century that over the ocean, temperatures were measured with a bucket. They would actually throw a bucket over the side of the ship, reel a bucket back in, stick a thermometer into it, and that would be the sea surface temperature measurement that was recorded. But beginning uh, about the second half of the, of the 20th century, uh, the bucket temperatures were replaced by engine, engine room injection temperatures. So there is an injection port in the engine room and seawater is brought in to cool the engines and there's the thermometer there that takes the temperature. Why is that important? Well, the bucket temperatures are known to be biased cool by about a tenth of a degree centigrade because the water would cool as you brought the bucket um, ashore up, or, um, up on deck. And that would produce about a tenth of degree cooling. And by the same token, the engine room temperatures were biased warm by about two tenths of a degree because the engine room is a very warm place. So that taken together, that could produce a, a bias of, of warming. It wouldn't be, wouldn't be real. Don't worry about it. That's all been corrected out, very carefully corrected out. So all those corrections have been made. So now I'm gonna roll this animation and I'm gonna call out the decades here. And uh, I'd like you to just focus on the colors. Pay particular attention to what happens in the 70s. Remember the plot we were just looking at a little bit while ago, and we saw how the temperatures really took off in the 70s. We'll take a look at that here, then the, the animation will stop and we'll draw some conclusions. So here we go. Well, it didn't quite work. Let's go back here. Let's see. Here we go. All right, here we go. Okay, 1880s, 1890s, 1900s, 1910s, 1920s. 1930s, 1940s, 1950s, 1960s, get ready for the 70s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, 2000s, 2010s, and here we finish up at 2018. So a couple of things here, a couple of, draw a couple of conclusions here. First of all, the land is warming faster than the sea. Well, the sea is certainly warming. You see all these yellows and even oranges over the ocean. Even though about 95% of the heat of global warming is going into the ocean rather than the land. So why is the ocean warming slower? It's because the ocean has huge thermal capacity, about 100 times the thermal capacity of the land. That means the ability to absorb heat without warming up very much. So tremendous amount of heat going into the ocean but because the ocean has such great thermal capacity, it isn't warming nearly as fast as the land. The land is warming the fastest in the, near, in the Arctic region. The farther you go north, the more it's warming. It isn't warming so much in the tropics, but as you go north, it isn't warming so much in the southern hemisphere, but as you go north into the Arctic, it really, really starts to warm. In fact, the Arctic is warming about two to three times faster than the rest of the earth. And that's because of that snow ice feedback effect we talked about, and, and of course it operates most strongly in the Arctic here. Uh, it's not warming everywhere. Notice there are some blue patches here, mainly over the ocean, having to do with changes in ocean circulation. For example, this blue patch here has to do with the change in the, the, the Gulf Stream circulation. The Gulf Stream has shifted farther offshore and it's also weakened. And there have been changes in ocean circulation in the North Pacific. There have been changes in the Southern Ocean having to do with the Antarctic circumpolar current. So as the climate changes, the ocean circulation changes and that produces uh, areas where air is cooling. 
Notice over the continent of the United States, the western third of the U.S. is warming significantly more than the southeastern United States, for example. If you live in the southeastern United States, climate change is not as nearly as apparent to you as it is to us in the west, where we've warmed much more and we've also gotten much drier. So that's a depiction of what's going on and kind of good to see, good to see what, what that looks like. Let's um, move on and talk about what's causing this. What the heck is going on here? Well, in fact, it is indeed the greenhouse effect. And the greenhouse effect is best understood in the context of the Earth's energy budget, which is depicted here. This depicts uh, the, uh, the, the uh, balance of energy that controls the temperature of the Earth. Now, you may ask, you may look at this and say, hey, wait a minute, what about heat? What about other sources of heat that are not depicted on here, for example? What about heat from the Earth's interior? Why is it not on here? I mean, the Earth's core is very hot. There's heat coming up uh, from the Earth's interior. That's, in fact, how geothermal energy works, right? Why is it not on here? Well, it's not on here because it's really, really small. It's negligibly small compared to the incoming radiation from the sun. What about heat from buildings, waste heat from buildings? Uh, all these buildings that have gone up in air conditioning and heating, and all, what about the waste heat from that? Even smaller negligibly small. What about tidal friction? Tides are running around, you know, forced by the moon and, the, and there's some friction there. Very, very small. What about volcanoes? You, know, you name it, way small. This really is the ball game. The numbers on here, the Earth's energy balance is in fact the radiation balance that really dominates the Earth's uh, temperature. All those other sources of heat you can think of, they're negligibly small. They just wouldn't be depicted on here. So the greenhouse effect works like this in the context of this energy balance. The Earth is warmed by incoming solar radiation and it's cooled in two ways, by reflected solar radiation right here, which bounces off clouds and aerosols in the atmosphere. Aerosols are suspended particles such as air pollution, dust from, uh, from volcanoes, volcanic ash. And it's also co cooled by outgoing long wave radiation or infrared radiation. We refer to the incoming solar radiation as shortwave radiation, the outgoing infrared radiation as long wave infrared radiation. By the way, these numbers are watts per square meters and they depict the long-term average of these heat flows um, averaged over all the seasons, over in this case, a seven year period, averaged over the entire face of the earth, daytime, nighttime, all the seasons. And on average, the incoming solar radiations, for example, is about 341 watts per square meter and the outgoing is about 238.5. So incoming solar radiation warms the earth, reflected solar radiation, outgoing long radi radiation cool the earth. Greenhouse gases trap the outgoing long wave radiation and warm the lower atmosphere and the surface of the earth. And then finally, human activities increase greenhouse gases in the atmosphere and increase the warming. That's really what goes on here. That's what drives the warming, but the warming is amplified by feedback effects. And particularly this, this snow ice feedback effect, we, we kind of passed by quickly before, but it works like this. Increasing global temperatures caused by that greenhouse trapping decreases snow and ice. So for example, this is the depiction of, of ice covered sea here. As the earth gets warmer, this ice tends to melt and it leaves behind a much darker ocean. The, the ice reflects the sun, and you can see it right here. It reflects, it's highly reflective, but when it melts, it leaves behind a darker ocean, which absorbs the solar radiation, and that traps more heat in the earth. And that yields increasing sunlight absorbed by land and sea, which further increases the global temperatures, which further decreases snow and ice. And you go around this feedback loop. It's a positive feedback loop. It amplifies the warming. And similarly, there is the water vapor feedback. Increasing global temperatures yield increasing evaporation of water from oceans and land as the ocean is getting warmer. There's more evaporation occurring, but that puts more water vapor in the atmosphere. Water vapor is a powerful greenhouse gas, so that in, it traps more heat, increases the global temperature, which in turn increases the evaporation of water. And in fact, you go around this feedback loop and it amplifies the warming. Now, I know what you're thinking. You're thinking this must be an unstable system because we have these two positive feedbacks. It's like trying to balance. It's like you've got a you've got a um, you know an ice pick and you're trying to balance it on the on the on its point. You can never do that because there's these feedbacks called gravity which pulls you pulls you off. So how, 
how can the system be stable? Well, in fact, the climate system is very stable. And the reason why it's stable is there's a very powerful negative feedback loop. The previous feedback loops we talked out about were positive, they amplify the change. There's also a very positive negative feedback, which tends to attenuate the change. And that's called the long wave, long wave radiative feedback effect. And this is the only equation I'm gonna show you in this talk here. The famous equation is called the Stefan Boltzmann equation. And it says that the alkaline long wave, wave radiation of an object is proportional to the absolute temperature to the fourth power. Absolute temperature is like the centigrade temperature scale, except it starts at absolute zero, which is minus 273 degrees centigrade. So as the uh, earth warms up, the outgoing long wave radiation increases in proportion to this temperature of the fourth power. It means it increases very rapidly and that tends to cool the earth back down. So this negative feedback will work such that if the earth tries to warm up, it, this tries to cool it back down. Earth tries to cool down, this tries to warm it back up. So the point is it's a stabilizing effect. And if we didn't have the forcing occurring of putting more and more greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, in fact, the Earth's climate would stabilize, although it would take some time to happen. It wouldn't happen overnight. And we'll talk about a little bit about that later on. Now, this is not just me talking. You know, I'm not telling you anything here that, that uh, isn't um, accepted science. In fact, um, what I'm showing here is a, a partial list of leading science organizations around the world that have made formal declarations confirming human-induced global warming, exactly as I've described it to you. That includes uh, the um, three most prestigious organizations in the U.S., science organizations, the U.S. National Academy of Sciences, the U.S. National Research Council, the American Association for the Advancement of Science, as well as the uh, two science organizations in the U.S. that have purview over the atmosphere and the ocean. That's the American Meteorological Society, the American Geophysical Union, and the list goes on and on. Royal Society of London, you name it. There is an overwhelming international scientific consensus on this matter, and that is um, global warming is being produced by humans for the, in, the, in the manner I've described it to you. So let's talk about these greenhouse gases. Um, they are water vapor, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, and the F gases or the fluorinated gases. Fluorinated gases are man-made gases that are used in refrigerants, they're used in insulation, they're used in uh, production of semiconductors, that sort of thing. Now notice I've colored water vapor differently, and that's because water vapor, although it actually traps more outgoing long ra wave radiation than any other gas, it does not drive long wave, it does not drive global warming. Why is that so? It's because water vapor, which we perceive as humidity in the atmosphere, is in balance with the natural hydrologic cycle. And it's not increasing, except as the hydrologic cycle uh, increases or nudges it to increase because the ocean's warming, it's not increasing otherwise. It's, that's because uh, it's in balance with the natural hydrologic cycle. And um, uh, we're not putting large amounts of water vapor into the atmosphere. So water vapor, although it does trap a lot of long wave radiation, it does participate in global warming through the water vapor of feedback loop. It does not drive war global warming. That's an important distinction. Water vapor does not drive global warming. The ones colored in magenta here do. These, green, these anthropogenic or produced by man greenhouse gases, CO2, carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, the fluorinated gases, they are not in balance with any uh, natural cycle because we are putting year after year more and more of these gases into the atmosphere. And as a result, they are increasing and increasing. Now, here's a snapshot in time of the contribution of the various greenhouse gases to the current rate of global warming. And about 72% per, of the current rate of warming is being caused by carbon dioxide, 20% being caused by methane, 5% nitrous oxide, 4% fluorinated gases. The interesting thing about this is the potency of these gases actually is inverted. This, the F gases are by far the most potent, followed by nitrous oxide, methane, and, and CO2 is actually less potent than these other gases. It's just that fortunately, there isn't a lot of these other gases in the atmosphere, but there is a heck of a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere, and we're putting a lot of CO2 in the atmosphere. So indeed, CO2 is the dominant contributor to the current rate of warming, and we're going to focus most of our attention on CO2 to the rest of this talk. Now, you may have heard of this, the Keeling curve. 
this is a depiction of the Keeling curve. It's a measurement of, of CO2 in the atmosphere. What we're looking at here is CO2 from 1700 to 2019. And you can see that, um, well, first of all, CO2 levels are usually reported in parts per million. And the pre-industrial level was about 280 parts per million. We're now well above 400. I think we're around 420 now parts per million. You can see beginning uh, about the 1960s, things really took off and, and increased rapidly here. Sometimes you'll see the Keeling curve depicted as a smooth line. Sometimes you'll see it kind of as a choppy line. That's because there was an annual cycle. And CO2 is maximum in the spring and minimum in the fall. And sometimes they show the annual cycle, sometimes they average out the annual cycle. But the point is, it's really, CO2 really started, started taking off exponentially in the 1960s, such that we're now about 50% over the pre-industrial level. Um, it's also interesting to talk about the mass of CO2 in the atmosphere. Um, since in the period 1850 to 2018, the total amount of CO2 emitted by human activities amounted to about 2 trillion tons. Not billion, trillion, 2 trillion tons of CO2. And about 1.1 trillion tons of that is still there in the atmosphere. Um, we're putting CO2 in the atmosphere about two to three times faster than natural, the natural carbon cycle can take it out. And as a result, it's going up and up. And we're currently putting in uh, CO2 into the atmosphere at the rate of about 40 billion tons per year, 40 billion tons per year. So where is it coming from? Well, here's CO2 emissions by economic sector. Um, the, the top three account for almost, uh, almost uh, you know, two thirds of the, um, of the uh, emissions. The top one is electricity and heat production. That's basically energizing the power grid. This is, these are global numbers. The second is the agricultural, forestry, and other land use. That would include lamb and beef production. Deforestation is a big one. And then finally, uh, industrial production, steel and particularly cement production. Uh, a byproduct of cement, steel and cement production is, in fact, in addition to energy it takes, is, in fact, CO2 emissions. And then transportation is actually pretty small on a global basis, only about 14%. 10% is fossil fuel production, that's petroleum refineries, and finally about 6% is due to on-site fossil fuel burning and building of homes, for example, heating and cooking with natural gas. So by economic sector, this is what it looks like. Top three are the really the big ones here. Electricity and heat production, agriculture, forestry, and other land use, and industrial production. So who are the top emitters? Now this is a graph from 2013, but I think these numbers are still pretty relevant. China's number one by a wide margin, still true. The United States number two, we're down by a factor of about two below uh, China, but we emit more than all of the European Union uh, nations together, followed by India, Russia, Japan, and down the list. That's looking at the total emissions. Another way of looking at it is the per capita emission. So there you simply take the total emissions and divide by the number of people in the country. There's a lot of people in China, they drop down, and guess what, we're number one. Our uh, United States, the per capita average um, CO2 footprint is 17 tons per year. So the average American emits about 17 tons of CO2 per year. It has to do with our consumption of energy, all the products we consume, gasoline, et cetera, et cetera, about 17 tons. We're number one, but there are a couple other countries that are pretty close behind us. Canada, uh, Saudi Arabia, Australia are pretty close behind. So here's where we are. We looked at this chart before. Here's that red spike we're looking at. The question is, where are we going? Well, it depends on what we do. It depends on uh, to what extent we're successful in constraining these, these emissions. If we ca carry through with the full recommendations of the Paris Climate Accord, which means we would reduce emissions by 2050 by a factor of about two to three below where we are now. And we would continue reducing those emissions to pretty close to zero by the end of the century, by 2100, not all the way to zero, but pretty close to zero. Then we could hold global warming to this level here, 1.5 degrees centigrade plus or minus 0.7. So there's uncertainty here. On the other hand, if we don't do anything, if we adopt what's generally referred to as business as usual, which means we just say, 
forget about the Paris Climate Accord, like the United States has done. We're just going to do whatever we want to do. Drill, baby, drill. Well, this is where we're going. 4.5 degrees C plus or minus 1 degree C. Now, it, look at this in the context of where we've been. From the beginning of human civilization, there's been very little variation. There's been this slow cooling trend here. And now suddenly we're taking off like a rocket and going up here with warming that's comparable to the warming that we've experienced coming out of the last ice age. That is catastrophically huge. And you can really see that in the context of this 22,000 year view. So where are we actually going to end up? Well, we're gonna actually end up, I predict somewhere in between. Uh, I'm very confident we're not going to go here. I mean, you know, we're, we're taking steps and, and certainly future generations are gonna take steps to make sure we don't go there. But I can also tell you we're not, we're not on track to go here. We are already fallen well behind and the emission cuts that, that would be required to get to this point. We are not on track to achieve this. So we're gonna be somewhere in the middle, maybe somewhere around three degrees, two and a half, three degrees. That's pretty bad. Uh, so that's, that's kind of where we are. So what are the consequences of this? Well, I like to divide the consequences into two categories natural consequences and human consequences. So natural consequences are the consequences to the, to the natural world. So we have increasing temperature of the land, ocean, and lower troposphere. Now the, the troposphere is the lowest layer of the atmosphere from the surface to about 40,000 feet where you fly in a jet airliner at altitude. That's where all the weather occurs. It's only the lower half of that troposphere from the surface up to about 20,000 feet that's warming above 20,000 feet, which is about halfway to altitude when you're in a jet airplane, it's actually cooling. All the way above that, it's cooling. Why is that true? Because the heat that would normally warm that upper atmosphere is being trapped below because of this greenhouse effect. So you're actually getting decreasing temperature of the upper troposphere and above. And that creates a more unstable atmosphere. You're, you're cooling the atmosphere above, heating it from below, that makes the atmosphere more unstable, warm air rises, and it's that warm air rising that gives the uh, energy to storms. So we're seeing increasing frequency and intensity of severe storms, severe weather, and also increasing frequency of light-threatening heat waves as the lower troposphere gets warmer and warmer. Now, in terms of moisture in the atmosphere, there's an increasing absolute humidity, which is the water content of the air. As the air gets warmer, it can hold more moisture. So the, the absolute humidity, the amount of water in the air is increasing. And that is leading to an increasing frequency and intensity of floods in wet regions like the Southeastern United States, for example. But at the same time, even though the absolute humidity is increasing, the relative humidity, which is the likelihood of precipitation is decreasing. You've heard relative humidity, hundred percent, you know, it's gonna, it's gonna rain and 50%, it's pretty dry. Well, it, even though there's the water kind of the air is going up, the relative humidity is going down because as the air gets warmer, it can hold more moisture. And uh, that decreases the likelihood of precipitation. So in, in generally dry areas like where we live, where it's hard to get that 100% relative humidity up in the clouds and produce rain, it gets gonna get even harder. So what that means is dry areas get drier. So wet areas would get wetter, where areas that normally have lots of precipitation that are gonna get wetter, have more floods. Dry areas like where we live are gonna get drier and less, less rainfall, more loss of moisture from, from the surface, which means increasing frequency of droughts and wildfires in dry regions. And that's just a trend that's been going on already. We've seen it in the West for the last you know, 40 or 50 years. Decreasing snowfall relative to rainfall, that's not good for us in California because, you know, the snowpack in the Sierras is a big source of water for us through the dry season, through the summer, but we're going to get decreasing snowfall because, um, you know, it's harder to form snow, ice crystals as the atmosphere warms, so more precipitation will fall as rain rather than snow. Not good because it, it runs off through the rivers. We really like to have it fall as snow here in California. That's a problem for us because that yields decreasing mountain snowpacks and earlier snow melt not good for handling droughts. Melting of ice sheets and glaciers. Of course, that produces rising sea levels. Those, that water that melts from the ice sheets and from the glaciers goes into the ocean. That causes the sea level to rise. And we're gonna look at that in more detail in a second. 
decreasing pH of seawater, ocean acidification. I'm gonna take you back to your high school chemistry here. There's that pH scale, which runs from, from one to 14. The ocean is slightly on the basic side, about eight, uh, but it's trending more towards the, the acidic side as more and more CO2 is dissolved in the ocean. As CO2 uh, dissolves in the ocean, it combines with the water to form H2CO3, carbonic acid, and that makes it's making the ocean increasingly trending towards the acidic side. Big problem for the uh, larva of shellfish and corals. Also decreasing oxygen levels in the ocean, big problem for fish. So that reels increasing mortality of coral reefs, it's called coral bleaching, and also decreasing productivity of fisheries. Uh, big problem around the world because, um, you know, we're, as population increases, we look more to the ocean for, for, for ways to feed the growing population, but we're going to be looking at decreased productivity of, of fisheries because of these effects on the ocean. And finally, increasing species migrations and extinction and extinctions with loss of biodiversity. Remember that loss of biodiversity, that's a big problem. And I'll, I'll come to that in a second here. Now, I want to highlight a couple of ones here. This is a, a plot of global number of severe weather events by year from 1980 through to 2010. And there are three different types of, of uh, this is the number of events right here. And this is the time here from 1980 to 2010. We're looking at severe storms, that would be hurricanes, uh, tornadoes, severe winter storms, uh, severe floods, and heat waves, droughts, and, and wildfires. You can see that in all three cases, there is this upward trend, very clear upward trend from the 1980s to the current time uh, for exactly the reasons we've been talking about. Sea level rise, what we're looking at here is Global mean sea level rise in millimeters from 1900 to 2015. 1900 to 2015, global mean sea level rise millimeters. Over here, I'm showing it in inches. So from 1900 to 2015, um, this, the global mean sea level has risen, risen about eight inches. That's a lot. And furthermore, and very concerning, is the fact that it is accelerating. Notice that this curve is bending upward. The sea level rise is accelerating. It's going to particularly take off after 2050. And that's because the, um, the, uh, the uh, Antarctic ice sheets will really start melting about that time frame. and it seems to be the predictions. And so we're really looking at uh, more rapid sea level rise after 2050, such that the sea level is gonna be about one meter, possibly as much as two meters, above where it is now by the end of this century. And that's a real problem for lots of, of uh, places around the world. In fact, uh, in terms of impact on people, about a one meter rise in global sea level produced, uh, displaces about 100 million people around the world. And a two meter rise displaces about 200 million people around the world. Uh, 30 million people in Bangladesh alone, mostly people in Asia, mostly people in, in poor countries that exist on low ground. Huge problem, where are those people gonna go? It's a big problem. And it's gonna be a problem in the United States too, our coastal cities are gonna be under, are under siege by the, by the rising sea levels. So what about human consequences of the warming world? Well, increasing economic costs, resulting from increasing frequency and intensity of damaging weather events, increasing prevalence of wildfires, big issue for us here, and rising sea levels. Increasing competition among nations for water and food caused by increasing drought and decreasing agriculture and fisheries production. Increasing displacements of people and unrest in populations susceptible to recruitment by violent extremist groups caused by drought, flood, weather, sea level rise. Increasing human mortality from heat waves. It turns out heat waves kill more people around the world than any other phenomena. More people die from heat waves every year than any other phenomena. Forget tornadoes, hurricanes, it's heat waves. And heat waves are going to definitely be on the rise, along with um, other severe weather events, starvation, disease, and war. Increasing threats to human health as tropical diseases spread into the higher latitudes. Um, the spread of Zika virus into South, into South Florida and Texas is a good example of that. Um, the uh, arrival of dengue fever from Central America into the United States is another example of that. But also reduced biodiversity. Reduced biodiversity increases the likelihood that diseases will jump from animals to humans. Now, 
there's a lot of papers being written about this, a lot of, a lot of speculation that, that COVID-19 came from bats in China. And uh, we don't have that pinned down yet, but that seems to be the working hypothesis. And there's a lot of evidence to support the fact that climate change is increasing the likelihood that diseases will jump from animals to humans, may have played a role in COVID-19. No one can prove that yet, but I predict that, that it's very possible that's going to be playing a role there. Basically, as habitats come under uh, assault, animal habitats come under stress from climate change and from human encroachment that decreases biodiversity. For example, you have a situation where you have a, a ecosystem that's in balance. Suddenly, climate change and human incursion causes that to go out of balance such that, say, the rodent population starts to explode. The higher mammals are, are, are gone. Rodents take off for example, rats. And uh, the rodents, rodents in particular are very good at transmitting disease, diseases to humans, bats, for example. Um, so that's a problem. You know, climate change could indeed, in fact, many people believe it is playing a role in the uh, transmission of diseases like COVID uh, from the animal kingdom to humans. And finally, these risks are unevenly distributed between groups of people. And in between regions, the risks are generally greater for disadvantaged people living in developing countries, but it's going to touch all of us and it's certainly going to touch us in the United States for sure. So now we're going to talk about the impact of the COVID-19 pandemic. This is all this is all all uh, prequel to uh, you know, set the stage for the science and everything. Now we're going to talk about the impact of the pandemic. It'd be nice to say there was something good coming out of it. Well, first of all, the economic fallout from the pandemic has produced the largest drop in global energy demand since the Great Depression of the 30s. And this drop in energy demand has translated directly into a drop in global CO2 emissions. If some restrictions on economic activity stay in place worldwide until the end of the year, then global CO2 emissions will likely drop by about 7 to 10 or 7%, which is 6 to, 6 to 10 times larger than during the 2008 global recession. China has been responsible for the biggest drop in CO2 emissions, followed by the US, Europe, and India. So the question on the table is, is the fall off in CO2 emissions caused ultimately by the pandemic a silver lining that will help the world achieve the goals of the Paris Climate Accord? Well, to address that question, we're gonna take a look at this chart right here. What we're looking at here is, year yearly emissions of CO2 in billions of tons per year from 1900 up until uh, 2020. The red dot here is the forecast for the end of 2020. And uh, you can see it's quite large compared to, for example, the Great Depression. The Great Depression yielded this much of a fall off. Well, we're looking at already more than that. In the World War II, uh, the oil crisis here, the financial crash, crash of 2008. This is a big dip. It's a pretty big dip here. It's bigger than any of the other changes here. So uh, you might think, well, that's great. It's really gonna have a big impact here. Well, um, here's the problem. Where we need to go by 2050 is here. And the fall off in, in 2020 is really just kind of a drop in the bucket. Um, we really need to go in this trajectory to get down here to about 1960s level of emissions by 2050 and keep it coming down to pretty close to zero by the end of this century, as I mentioned earlier. And um, the question then is, is this, is this a way to get there? Is this, is this starting us off in a path that will take us there? And uh, I, I want to say back a little bit on the science here too, by the way, you know, um, what would happen, let's just imagine if, what would happen if we could suddenly have, if I, this, is a good, this is a thought experiment. This is an experiment where you imagine something's going to happen and draw some conclusions about it. Imagine we had a, a magic wand and we could suddenly and instantaneously draw out these emissions way down here such that the CO2 in the atmosphere remained constant. That Keeling curve suddenly went, went flat, straight across. What would happen? Would global warming stop immediately and things would be good? The answer is no. The Earth would continue to warm for about 20 years, a couple of decades, because there was a long time scale 
response to the of the climate system. It's like you're bringing a uh, uh, an ocean liner into the dock in San Francisco. You got to start putting the brakes on way earlier, else you're going to crash in that dock. So just because we, even if we were able to bring the CO2 down instantaneously, the Earth would continue to warm for about 20 years. It would warm at a decreasing rate, which is good, and eventually it would stabilize to, this, to that the stabilizing uh, that that negative feedback loop we talked about. That that uh, IR feed the infrared radiation feedback loop would cause it to stabilize, but it would take about 20 years to do that. So the point of that is, you know, just a, a one-time shot here is not good enough. You've got to sustain it for decades because the time, uh, the time scale of the climate system responding is decades. So you've got to sustain it for decades and you've got to really bring it way down here. So the question is, <clears throat> is the fall off in emissions, the silver lining such that this would set us on a path to get to where we need to be by 2050 and ultimately even closer to zero? by 2100. So let's ex examine that. <clears throat> let's see outlook for that. On the positive side, many see the efforts to contain the economic fall of the pandemic, of the pandemic as an opportunity to accelerate the shift to cleaner energy alternatives. You've probably heard uh, uh, Vice President Biden campaigning saying, we wanna build back better. And in Europe, they're saying build back greener and that kind of thing. Options could ensure, could include ensuring that economic stimulus programs prioritize investments in cleaner energy or conditioning assistance to business, especially in carbon intensive sectors on drastic cuts in emissions. Similarly, financial and industry bailouts could require banks to invest less in fossil fuel and more in climate change mitigation and resilience efforts. Prospects for a green stimulus and recovery are promising in Europe, which could provide an example for the rest of the world. In response to a call to abandon climate measures, an EU spokesperson was categorical in saying, while our immediate focus is on combating COVID-19, our work on delivering the European Green Deal continues. The climate crisis is still a reality and necessitates our continued attention and effort. So Europe is hopefully on the right path. On the negative side, in the US, congressional Democrats pushed for measures that would accelerate the shift to renewable energy alternatives when negotiating the recent stimulus package, the previous stimulus package, but President Trump threatened a veto and the proposed measures did not survive. In the US, after the oil lobby petitioned the Trump administration to relax enforcement, EPA said it would not penalize companies that fail to comply with federal monitoring or reporting requirements if they could attribute their non-compliance to the pandemic. And in recent days, EPA announced a rollback on car emission rules that were a central piece of US efforts to reduce greenhouse gas emissions. In the US, some fossil fuel firms have been determined to pursue government bailouts without strings binding them to a less polluting future. This tweet speaks for itself. Uh, the Trump administration is uh, bound and determined to support the oil and gas industry and support the continued burning of fossil fuels. And they're not particularly interested in transitioning to green energy. On the negative side, the European Union has come under pressure to shelve crucial climate initiatives, with Poland calling for a carbon trading program to put in on hold, and the Czech Republic urging that the EU's landmark climate bill be abandoned, while airline companies have pressed regulators to delay emissions cutting policies. China has already announced delays in climate change programs, extending deadlines for companies to meet environmental standards and postponing an auction for the right to build several huge solar farms. China has accelerated its building of coal-fired power plants, approving in the first few weeks of March 2020 the equivalent of 7,960 7, megawatts of new coal-fired plants, which was more than the number agreed to in the whole of 2019. In Brazil, the Federal Environmental Agency announced it is cutting back on its enforcement duties, which include protecting the Amazon from accelerated deforestation, huge problem, that could lead to the release of massive amounts of greenhouse gases that are stored in one of the world's most important carbon sinks. It's really, it's really a disaster what's going on down in the, in, the, in, the, uh, in the Amazon. On the negative side, <clears throat> reducing greenhouse gas emissions to the levels required to halt and eventually reverse climate change will require significant investments, about 1% of global GDP every year for the next 30 years. Now, cash-strapped governments saddled with tremendous debt from stimulus spending will find it much harder to make these needed investments in climate change programs. 
as the world struggles to recover economically. And with a glut of low-priced low priced oil available, there will be tremendous temptation to forge ahead with heavy fossil fuel usage as a quick and cheap way to revive economies. Here's a little bit about the investments required. Um, oh, by the way, there's, there's a website called Project Drawdown. It's, it's drawdown.org, and I highly recommend that. I'm not going to explore that with you today, but I highly recommend you that on your own. Drawdown.org. <coughs> They've done a great job of, of um, prioritizing and costing out solutions to climate change, and they are able to work up these uh, uh, solutions to achieve different scenarios. They talk about two different scenarios. Scenario one is whole global warming to two degrees C. That's sort of the basic uh, prediction by, by the end of the century. That's basic um, goal of the climate Paris Accord, but the more stringent goal and, and the sort of stretch goal for the Paris Accord is whole global warming to one and a half degrees centigrade by the end of the century. The 30 year cost of the world would be about $23 trillion for scenario one, about 30 trillion for scenario two, which is a little more than uh, 1% of global GDP. Now, if those, but here's the, here's the silver, silver lining. In addition to saving the world, there is a return on investment. In scenario one, return on investment of 95 trillion. And in scenario two, a return on investment of about 145 trillion. So you spend 30 trillion to return about 145 trillion. It's a good deal, but still there's money up front required. Now, if those investments were partitioned, uh, a portion, I should say, uh, in proportion to um, a GDP, then the US share of that would be about 190 billion per year for scenario one and about 250 billion per year for scenario two. But again, there's a, there's a significant return on investment in both scenarios. Uh, and by the way, the, um, where's this money gonna come from? Well, the International Monetary Fund concludes that the global fossil fuel industry is currently subsidized at about 5 point trillion per year or about 6.5% of global GDP. Some of the richest countries in the world being subsidized by 5.2 trillion per year. Uh, you know, there's money there. You know, all you gotta do is modestly cut these, these uh, subsidies to the fossil fuel industry and then the money's there, both uh, globally and in the US. Not saying that's politically easy to do. It's politically very difficult to do because these subsidies are essentially embedded, deeply embedded, intrinsically embedded into the US tax code. And there's a whole slew of lobbyists paid for by the fossil fuel industry. They're bound and determined to make sure those subsidies don't come out. But that is a target and it should be a target. And that's something which you may want to talk to Congressman Panetta about. He's in a position to do something about that on the Ways and Means Committee. And that's what should be done. We should be going after these subsidies to the oil industries and that money should be put towards dealing with climate change. So continuing on the, on the negative side, uh, the UN's annual climate summit, which was scheduled to take place in Glasgow in November was postponed until sometime next year or as a result of the pandemic. Other international meetings related to climate on biodiversity in the oceans, for example, have also been postponed. So while the need to mobilize governments to act on climate has never been more urgent, the inability to gather world leaders to address the issue could make it all that much more difficult to do so. So in summary, is there a climate change silver lining to the COVID-19 pandemic? My answer is no. Now this is just my opinion. And uh, I, I draw that a conclusion because I believe the negatives far outweigh the positives as discussed on the prior slides. And also history provides a clue as well. In the initial aftermath of a global financial crisis of 2008, global CO2 emissions decreased by 1.4% only to rise by 5.9% in 2010 as the planet continued to warm at an alarming rate. So I conclude that after the pandemic is over, we will be right back where we were before or perhaps even worse off as governments struggle with heavy debt and pressure to put people back to work quickly uh, investment in dealing with climate change may fall to lower priority. Just my opinion, and you guys may have another different opinion, and be happy to talk about that. So what can you do? Well, brings me to my closing comments, and we'll have time for Q&A. Uh, first of all, you can learn the basics of the science behind why our planet is warming and the climate is changing, and you've taken a huge step tonight in doing that by suffering through all this science with me. You've taken a huge step in that direction. That's good. You can do what you can to reduce your carbon footprint 
while still living the life you want to live. And there's lots of ways to do that. You can join an advocacy group, such as the Citizens Climate Lobby, CCL, and participate actively. And I should tell you, there is a, uh, an active Monterey chapter of CCL. We meet monthly, and we would love to have you join. Whenever you have an opportunity to interact with a leader in your community, be they political or otherwise, let them know that you want to see action taken on this issue. Become a leader in your community. And of course, I know as members of the Green Party, many of you are already leaders in this issue, and that's great. And finally, last but not least, vote for candidates who will address your concerns about climate change. So that's it. I appreciate your attention. I'm going to now stop sharing and bring my face back up and open it up to questions. So if you have a question, just unmute yourself and go ahead and ask away. <laughs> um, Celia. Yes. Um, so I was kind of personally a little more um, curious, and I don't know, you touched on this, but maybe you can elaborate more um, about as opposed to COVID's effect on climate change, but climate change's effect on not necessarily just COVID, but pandemics, yes. um, you know, and the possibility of this becoming the new normal, not just with dealing with COVID now, but once we get a vaccine for that or whatever, is this yeah. just going to keep happening? Will the, yes. the next pandemic come along? Um, and kind of interested in how the, you touched on it, but the, yeah. but climate change, among all those other terrible effects it's having, um, ca possibility of causing more um, pandemics and- Absolutely. That and sort of yes. The issue there is um, animal habitats coming under stress. And there are two things that stress animal habitats. One is climate change. For example, you know, uh, you're in a region where you're, you're losing rainfall and so drought becomes an issue and that puts a stress on, on, the, on the wildlife in the area. Um, the other issue would be um, human encroachment, deforestation, mm. um, deforestation, uh, logging, burning, burning of you know the, the Amazon, um, a civilization encroaching into otherwise wild areas. What that does is it, and I'm going to use a very technical scientific term here. It throws the ecosystem out of whack. Throws it out of whack. And if you have a whack, that leads to um, decreasing biodiversity. Biodiversity, you know, having many different species, you know, all interacting together in, in, in a symbiotic kind of way, that is sort of like, um, it's kind of like antibodies to these, these diseases. Um, mm -hmm. The biodiversity tends to help tamp that down. But when you lose the biodiversity, and, and the example I like to give is, you know, you've got, you have some ecosystem and, and all of a sudden the climate's change over the developmental encroachment, you know, from humans causes the uh, higher mammals to flee or to die off. And so then suddenly the rodents take off because they don't have any predators. And now the rodent population explodes, for example, rats or bats or, you know, what have you. And the rodents generally are much better at transmitting diseases from, uh, from the animal world to the human world. Many of the, of the viruses that have gone from from humans to, or from animals to humans have come from mm -hmm. rodents. So you have that kind of thing going on. So generally speaking, it's, it's putting um, animal habitats under stress from both climate change and increasing temperatures, decreasing uh, moisture, decreasing rainfall, decreasing water, decreasing food supply, uh, putting the, the habitat under stress, causing species to die out, causing species to, to move away and uh, loss of biodiversity. And that's creating an environment where, uh, first of all, these uh, pathogens uh, tend to flourish more in the animal kingdom when they're under stress. Mm -hmm. And then because of the lack of biodiversity, there's a greater probability that those pathogens will jump from the animal world to the human world. And there's, there's many examples where that's happened in the past. And there's a lot of, a lot of speculation now that um, it is in fact gonna get worse. Uh, there are certain pockets around the world where these things are prevalent and there are concerns, you know, for example, AIDS, you know, came from, from, uh, came from the simian flu, I think is where it was the original from, from monkeys basically. Mm -hmm. And there, there are lo there's lots of examples of, of, uh, you know, right. from animals. Right. Yeah. Thanks. So to put a, 
positive spin on it, it all those things that we can do to help climate change that you talked about with decreasing energy use and I'll throw in a little personal plug for organic farming say yes. should, organic farming is huge. Yeah, yeah should have a positive effect also on hopefully the future of pandemics and decreasing their rate as well as you know decreasing all the other negative effects of global warming Yes, we, we basically need to do what we can to leave the natural world alone as, as, as best we can, you know, and still grow human civilization. But we need to understand that, um, you know, our future is intertwined with the future of the natural world. And so we need yeah. to protect the natural world. You know, David Attenborough, the greatest natural of our time, talks about that frequently. Mm-hmm. And it's really, we need, to, we need to protect the oceans, we need to protect the forests. Uh, we need to protect the natural world because we live in a symbiotic relationship with the natural world. And if we, if we abuse it, then it's going to abuse us back. Yeah. Thank you. Mike, yes. uh, could you please put your next to the last uh, slide on with your contact information? And I can't tell you how spectacular your talk has been. Oh, um, thank you. Are, are you going to, will, will this be on the Green Party website? Do you know what you just? They, uh, yeah, what I'll do is I will I will send out a um, I'll produce a uh, distribution copy. Okay. And I'll send it to George, and he can put it out there if he wants oh, okay. to, or he can send copies to you guys, and it'll have my contact information on there. Okay. And then that last slide, if you'd be so kind. Sure. I'm going to just go ahead and share my screen again, and let's see. There we go. You can, there's my email address and my phone number. Yeah, and, thank, um, you. thank you. If you, uh, anyone um, knows a future group that would like to hear from me, and please contact me, and I'll be happy to speak to them. Yes, I'm um, on, the, on the board of the Peace Center, and I know they would love to have you give this. I, I, I'm gonna, I'd love to hear this again and again. <laughs> well, you, you I, got, I can, yeah. I can I can also I I can slant it to d- different directions depending on what you're interested in. But yeah, I'd be I'd be love to I'd love to speak to that. Yeah, yeah. No, that was just absolutely sensational. I oh, just thank re- you. wish that my head were able to grab all that, but I did take screenshots, so I'll be sitting quietly and looking at it. Yeah. And like I said, I'll I'll send George um I'll send George a distribution copy, and hopefully, he can get it out to everyone that's interested. Can you recommend any kind of a book? I will um, make up a title, Climate Change for Idiots. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, I, I recommended a book to a friend of mine a while back, and um, I thought it was going to be a good choice. And he went out, he bought, a, he, I think he bought about a dozen. He was going to send them out to all his children and, and grandchildren and everything. And then he got the book and he read it and he, and he said, no, it, it was too hard. <laughs> yeah, so sure. I'm going to, let me, let me think about that for a while. Uh, right now, sure. I don't have a good answer. Yeah. Uh, Looks like so, Sylvia has a question. Yes, I have, two, I have two questions. Yes. One is that in 2018, we have elected some uh, new congressmen and they are pushing for the new deal, the green new deal. Green new deal, yes. Yes. What? If we were to embrace that and have more of the leaders embracing that, that would be really a great help. Does the Green New Deal, uh, in your opinion, would do it? That's question number one. Question number two is this. Why is it that the poor regions and poor countries are getting worse hit by this um rising of the temperature yes Why is it so great questions great questions uh the green new deal <clears throat> is um you know it's a it's a it's a um framework you know it's, it's a set of goals it isn't really specific legislation to do this and that but rather it's a, it lays out a set of goals and um a lot, many of those goals are climate is not the only part of it there's i think climate is probably about maybe one third and about two thirds, I think, are roughly have to do with sort of social issues, and I think they're all good, good stuff there. The uh, climate um, goals laid out by the Green New Deal are quite aggressive. They're quite aggressive, and um, 
you know, I think they're more aggressive than can be can be achieved, but that's okay. I mean, it's good to set the set the target high, and I, I think the Green New Deal has indeed set the target quite high. Um, you're probably aware the Green New Deal has been attacked uh, very vigorously by the right, by by people who are you know against this, and uh, and very unfairly. It reminded me a lot of the way Obamacare was attacked when that first came out. There were lots of discussions when Obamacare was first put out about there were going to be these death panels that were going to come out here and decide whether your grandmother was going to be able to go to the hospital or not. Well, a lot of the attacks on the Green New Deal are very, uh, very uh, reminiscent of those death panel attacks on Obamacare. And they said, well, the Green New Deal says we can't have air airplanes anymore. We're going to get rid of all the airplanes. Not true. Not true at all. So there's been a lot of wild, um, wild, uh, you know, uh, assertions against the Green New Deal. Generally, I applaud uh, uh, AOC for, for, for pushing that. I think the, 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 uh, the goals are, are very aggressive. I don't think they're achievable, but like I said, it's okay to set the target high. So generally speaking, I do support the Green New Deal. Speaking of congressmen, I got to put a plug in for our congressman, Jimmy Panetta. Um, he has been a real leader in the Congress uh, on climate change issues. There are, there are three, uh, three or four, um, no, I think there's three, three uh, carbon pricing bills that are going forward in the Congress. And one of them is sponsored by Jimmy Panetta. And, it's, and in my opinion, it's the best, by the way. I think it's really good. He's, he's a member of the Climate uh, Solutions Caucus. He's very good at working across the aisle, trying to work with the Republicans and all that. So we're lucky to have Congressman Panetta. And it's a high priority for him. He's, mm -hmm. he's been very actively engaged with the uh, Monterey chapter of CCL. So he's, you know, we're lucky to have him there. Uh, but we really need to have more uh, more democratic leadership, particularly on the Senate side and in the White House, quite frankly, to make progress uh, on this. Now, your other question was about why is the climate uh, issues hitting the poorer countries harder? And uh, that's a great question. I've kind of wondered about that myself. Part of it has to do with the fact that many of, of the uh, poorer countries are, are heavily overpopulated and they exist on low ground. Bangladesh is a, is a perfect example of that. You know, uh, there's 30 million people in Bangladesh that live only a, a meter above the sea level, that kind of thing. And also, generally speaking, the poorer countries are less able to invest, make the investments necessary to, uh, to deal with climate change, to adapt to climate change. Whereas a richer country like the U.S., you know, we can, we can afford to make investments and, and deal with it. The poor countries can't, um, and some of it is just you know kind of luck of the draw. One thing, uh, one thing I like to talk about sea level rise. And it's, it's something people don't really know. This is a, you guys are going to hear something really special here, <laughs> and that is um, you hear about sea level rise. It's not uniform. You know when you fill up your bathtub, the water goes up uniformly, but sea level rise globally is not uniform. In fact, it varies by a factor of about three. Uh, and it turns out, and why is that? That's because the ocean circulation is also changing as the climate changes and the ocean circulation has a proud, profound impact on sea level rise. Well, it turns out some of the areas where the sea level is rising the fastest or the, the area where the sea level is rising the fastest is in fact the Western tropical Pacific where you have all these island nations that are very close to sea level. And, you know, they're literally losing their countries. You know, they're, they're poor island nations that are, you know, going to be having to pick up, pick up, pack up and move to another island because they're going underwater. So it's those kinds of issues. Um, but, you know, it's going to ultimately hurt the rich countries as well. I mean, I, pretty much all of the coastal cities in the U.S. are going to be impacted by sea level rise at some point. Hi, this is Ephraim. Um, I have a question. Hi, Hey, um, someone came to my door, a candidate for uh, county supervisor, uh, when you were going through the last um, few slides. Oh, yeah. Campaigning District 4 here. Um, so the only he in that race, I think, still, uh, because it's now um, the, um, the runoff. Um, uh, is Steve McShane. Randy. Yeah, Steve McShane. So McShane. Um, what, what can we expect from our elected officials and candidates um, with regard to their positions on climate change? What can we do at, at the county level? And, and then of course, even all the way down to our, our personal households. 
Um, I think yeah. you were going into that in the last few slides and I missed it. Yeah, um, well, um, you know, I was saying become a leader and I got a feeling you're gonna be a leader reference. So don't be, don't shy away to take a leadership role in this, in this arena. Become a leader, talk to leaders, talk to your elected officials about climate change, express your concerns, express your interests and, and tell them you want to, to see them deal with this issue. But most of all, I would say, tell them to follow the science. Do what the scientists are saying. Accept the science. Don't deny the science. And uh, and and by the way, there's a lot of local issues that need to be dealt with. Uh, you know, agriculture is a huge um, source of greenhouse gases. There's you know, obviously the Salinas Valley is huge in agriculture. I think I think the there's a lot of good uh, agricultural science being done here, and I think we're on the right track there. But there's a lot of a lot of issues that can be dealt with locally in the Salinas Valley having to do with agriculture, on the Monterey Peninsula having to do with water, having to do with power, having to do with, uh, uh, you know, green energy. If you go down the Salinas Valley to Greenfield and you'll see, you know, those wind turbines down there, that's really fantastic. You know, more use of wind turbines, more use of solar farms. Um, there's a big, a good thing happening at Moss Landing. I, I don't know if you're aware of this, but, you know, as the Moss Landing power plant is being decommissioned, there, it's also it's becoming a site for a um, super um, battery storage facility. Yeah. It's going to be developing, you know, huge battery storage mm -hmm. capacity there, which um, goes hand in glove with exploiting uh, solar energy. So, you know, asking your local officials to invest in solar energy, wind power, uh, to make it easy for um, homeowners to do the right thing. You know, rooftop solar. You know, maybe advantages for. Um, you know, uh, uh, electric vehicles, things like that. And by the way, food food is a big one. Um, it turns out that uh, you, one personal choice you can make is if you shy away from beef and lamb and, and eat more towards the uh, plant based end of the spectrum, it really lowers your lowers your carbon footprint. Um, Throw away less food, less food. It turns out the world throws away about one third of the food produced and food production is a huge source of greenhouse gases. If we could just quit throwing away so much food, you know, that would help a lot. Uh, eat locally. You know, if you're gonna wanna eat a, a, a lobster, make sure that lobster grew up in California not Maine because you wanna fly that lobster all the way across the country. So eat, eating local is a good thing. Uh, shifting more towards uh, a plant-based diet, actually healthier, and it really brings down uh, your 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 foot your greenhouse or your uh, carbon footprint dramatically. Thank you. Uh, I want to uh, raise a point that you were worried that we will go back uh, to the old use of the fossil whatever because we wanted a quick reco economic recovery. Would yes. it be a case that we can state in that the if we uh, go solar and the the wind industry we can employ more people, yes. many more than the uh, oil industry? Absolutely. Would that be one way to get a lot of jobs going? Absolutely, absolutely. And you know the it's a good news story for California because we have a huge amount of solar resource in California. We have a huge amount of wind resource in California potential. We got lots of lots of land for solar arrays, lots of wind potential, and it just you know people ask me what are, what are you um, what are you pessimistic about? What are you optimistic about? I'm pessimistic about our current generation of leaders. Now, Jimmy Panetta is, 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 a, is an anomaly. He's, I'm not referring to him. I'm referring to the other leadership in the, in, the, in the Congress. Pessimistic about that, that generation, to deal with things. But I'm very optimistic about Efren's, Efren's generation because they really get it. And they're coming along. They'll be leaders, and they'll take, they'll take the bull by the horns at some point. But I'm also very optimistic about the technology, particularly wind and solar. Uh, and it begins to the point where it's just going to make good business sense. Ultimately, it just makes good business sense to get away from fossil fuels, to go to wind and solar, because first of all, it's actually cheaper. You have to replace a moss landing power plant. You have to replace a you know, big power plant. It's actually cheaper up front to produce, to replace it with a solar array, assuming you have the land, um, then uh, you know, an oil fi fired thing. And then in the long term, you save a huge amount of money because the sun is free. 
the wind power is is growing even faster. And uh, you know, here's a, it's one thing I like to mention, and that is, you know, guess what state? Guess what state in the in the United States is the number one leading state for wind power? Guess what state? Texas. Texas. You got it. That would be the ruby red oil producing state of Texas is number one in wind power, and that's because it just makes good business sense. They got a lot of wind resource down there. They got a lot of they got a lot of ranch land. The um, you know the um, uh, wind turbines don't take up much of a footprint. The cows love them. You know the cows follow the shadow around. They call it the, the cow sundial effect. So it just makes good business sense. And uh, you know it's, they're going to continue to be built out, and that's great. Eventually, the future we want to think about is you know we're powering the grid with wind and solar and hydro. And we're using that power to charge up our electric vehicles. We're using that power to desalinate our water. And it's all being done with renewables. And it can be done. It's just a question of, of you know, making those upfront investments. In the long term, it pays off. It just pays off. It's good business sense. Is transmission cost a major factor, though? I, I don't think so, Jim. Uh, I, I, you know, if you think about it now, the way the power grid works now um, you know, we, we use power in California that comes from Texas, <laughs> you know, they, it's transmitted pretty much all around the country. And I think, um, you know, and, and also I think that it will be distributed anyway. I think you'll, you're going to have wind and, and solar arrays, uh, pretty much distributed around the whole country. So I don't think that's going to be a, a big issue, but there is certainly going to be upfront investment required. And, and, you know, that is significant, but we just have to be moving in that direction. Excellent. Uh, Mike, uh, this is George. Um, I'm a little curious about uh, your messaging, uh, your audience, I suppose, and uh, who you message, how you message to your audience. Uh, it seems to me that uh, the cl uh, climate lobby <clears throat> has, a, um, has a structure on science. Your messaging uh, is directed to individuals. I'm trying to just get a response if I can, or some suggestions from you on how do we, how do we move from science uh, and, and data to the political world? Because you're talking to individuals and of course we have our own interest in where we speak and how we speak. Um, is, is there a political side to the climate uh, lobby? There is very much so. Uh, in fact, um, We've got some, you know, very accomplished, high-powered lobbyists in, in Washington that, that uh, lobby extensively, and and they also set up every 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 chapter. There's a chapter of CCL in every congressional district, and twice a year, the uh, the uh, national uh, office basically gives guidance out to the, all the chapters on on engagement with their members of Congress. And in fact, we just had an engagement with Jimmy Panetta and his staff about a month ago and we'll do that again i guess probably six months from now and um and, and we've had congressman panetta at one of our events as a speaker and actually two of our events and uh so we're, we're engaged at that level for sure um but you know it's it's also pretty much grassroots you know you got to build up from the grassroots you gotta you gotta gotta really um build up from there and you have to really understand what we're going against we're going against a um you know a, a very powerful uh, climate denial community funded to the tune of about a billion dollars a year by the oil and gas industry, about a hundred um, so-called uh, you know think tanks and research agencies that are funded by, by the oil and gas industry, a billion dollars a year, to essentially tr try to create doubt in the science and try to um, hold back any, any legislation that would, that would go forward and, and hurt the oil and gas industry. Uh, it's very analogous to the efforts of the tobacco industry in the 60s and 70s when it started to become apparent that cigarette smoking was, was damaging to health. Very analogous to the way that the tobacco industry responded to try to cast doubt on that science, to try to hold back the inevitable legislation. Same situation occurring with, with the oil and gas industry. In fact, some of the same PR firms, some of the same people that were supporting 
supporting the uh, campaign uh, in support of the tobacco industry are supporting the uh, campaign in support of in support of the fossil fuel industry. So there's a challenge there. You know, there um, there are uh, you know uh, members of the Senate who are climate deniers. There are members of the House who are climate died in the world climate deniers. So uh, you know, there's and there's a, there's a person in the White House who believes that the uh, that global warming is a Chinese hoax, Chinese hoax, quote unquote. So that's the kind of issues we're dealing with politically. But the way to address it, I think, is you build up from the grassroots. Well, it seems to me just a little bit more on that uh, point. Um, it's one thing to look at the fossil fuel industries or um, egg or individuals, but it's the economic uh, power that uh, that the jobs represent in all these industries. So. There's an income level. There's a there's a stability factor with families and incomes and you know college costs and you name it. Raising kids, just living, um, and uh, I, I think you're you're suggesting that we um, find avenues at every angle we can at the local level. Uh, I, I'm just. Can you add a little? Can you comment a little bit more about if we were to get engaged in the climate uh, uh, lobby? Uh, that what what would we be involved with? How how would that engagement look to a newcomer? Well, um, our goal for the last couple of years has been pushing the CCL uh, climate um, carbon pricing bill, and um, it was kind of unique because Jimmy Panetta had his own bill, but his bill was inspired by the bill we were pushing. So we feel that was a win. And uh, he, has, he has come out and said that he will support the CCL bill if his, his, his bill dies. But ultimately they may merge together and become the same bill, who, who knows? So essentially much, our, much of our effort has been in uh, engagement with Congressman Panetta and that's been very successful. He's, he's really come around and, and it wasn't a hard sell. He's, he's been very supportive. So that kind of thing. We're also trying to do outreach to schools. Um, we're talking about, you know, high school level, maybe junior high school level. Uh, we had started engagement with the um, MPUSD, Monterey Peninsula Unified School District, and we got some good positive feedback there. We had some engagement with York School, some of the other private schools. And then of course the pandemic happened and now it's, it's all up in limbo and they're not quite sure, you know, the climate engagement is kind of a lower priority for them. But ultimately, when that all gets squared away, we will probably be active in the schools and trying to uh, work with their science teachers to get more climate change study or climate change material into their curriculum, possibly engaging with them as, you know, uh, uh, guest speakers or helping them set up curriculum or science projects and that sort of thing. So that's the kind of thing we're doing, but generally trying to educate the community and, um, you know, we've had some engagement with city councils and uh, talking about, you know, the kinds of things that they might be wanting to, to do to, to um, you know, to uh, help mitigate climate change. Carmel has a big program going. They have actually a big initiative going and they invited me to speak to the city council at one point. Same thing with Monterey. So that kind of thing. Good. Um, I'm going to ask if anybody has any questions, they ought to speak up now because we're about at the end, I think. Hello? Can you hear me? Hello? We can hear you. We can uh, hear you. Go ahead. Question? Yes. Um, actually, I have about five. Um, <laughs> I've just been accumulating them. Um, all of them don't have to be answered, but um, I... Um, I was um, especially curious to hear um, about um, like the um, locust and um, like climate re refugees from um, that and other um, other you know climate change factors and um, like how all of that works with the like, supply chain. So like um, could uh, like um, it's just a, a don't know enough to theorize because um, when I do research, it's um, there's not a lot, and it seems like um, new to me. Like I know who she the is. most recent things I've been able to find on locusts were from like um, April, um, like in a deep sense. Um, so I was just curious if you had any um, more updated information about that. 
Um, you know, maybe you could send me an email, uh, put your questions in an email, and I could, uh, you know, get do a little more uh, digging on those and, and get back to you that way. Okay, sounds good. Uh, I have a comment. It, it can be formed into a question. Okay. Personally, when I hear stories of success, of uh, projects that uh, make the uh, winds and the, um, the sun, I feel energized. Like when I mm -hmm. heard the Texas is the biggest wind farm and which is the red state. I think that if we tell a lot of stories, that may help push people forward not to think about the old time, but think about the new time and to help mm -hmm. people embrace it. Not only the, each person, but also the leaders. Yes, absolutely. And the, the other thing about climate change is you know, it's a very long-term kind of thing. So we're really worrying about not just our, our lives, but the lives of future generations. That's what it's really all about. It's our children and grandchildren, great, great grandchildren, keep on going. You know, because um, climate change happens on scales of many centuries. And we have to ask ourselves a fundamental question. Do we care about the fate of future generations? I hope the answer is yes. Do we care what future generations are going to think about us when they look back and say, you know, you people back in the 21st century had a chance to fix this problem. Why didn't you? You know, they left it to us. So that, those are things we need to think about. That's true. One more comment. In that, yes. I think people actually are getting it. If you look at the, the stock market, the oil company stocks are all going down, and stocks like a Tesla in 2017 is below 200. Now it's over 12, 1,200 or whatever. I don't know the, 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 the money. So that people are actually looking forward to the renewable companies. So that yeah. I think some people get it. Yes. And again, I come back to the cigarette analogy. You know, there was all this, this effort to try to hold back, you know, the, the science and hold back the legislation that was going to be dealing with the, the problems of cigarette uh, tobacco usage. But ultimately, you know, it's overcome. And the same thing is going to happen here with the fossil fuel industry. But they're just trying to hold it back and hold it back. And what we have to do is push and push and push to try to break that dam and, and move towards that green future where we have the wind farms and the solar farms that are charging our electric vehicles and desalinating our water and and we're no longer putting uh, CO2 in the atmosphere. In fact, we're drawing it down. We need to actually bring it back down. And I think we'll get there. It's just that we'd like to get there sooner rather than later because the later we get there, the worse it's going to be for future generations to have to deal with it. Uh, uh, would you one more time repeat your um, your website? Well, I have a I have a YouTube channel, so you could go on YouTube and it's uh, um, it's uh, climate change matters with Mike Clancy. You could probably just go to YouTube and search on climate change Mike Clancy, and it will come up. And I've got about a half a dozen talks that are um, recorded on there. You can watch, and you you recognize a lot of the same slides, you know that kind of thing. So that's I don't actually have a website, but I do have that YouTube channel. And um, I will uh, send you, George, uh, my slides, and you can share those if you want. It has my email address and phone number on there if people want to contact me. It also okay. has the, it also has the has the name of the YouTube channel. All right. Well, th th thank you, Michael. And I would look forward to getting that, and I'll distribute it, you know, however I can. Um, I, I, I just wanted to mention. Can I mention really fast that? Um, the presentation is available now on both YouTube and Facebook. Um, it's live now, and when we're finished with live, the recording will be also available for you. Oh, that's great. If you can send me a link to the YouTube version of that, it'd be great, Audra. I appreciate it. It's perfect. It's in the chat. It's in the chat already. So if you save that file, you should have it. Okay. Yeah. Um, great. Well, th thank, thank you, Michael. Thank everybody who appeared. Um, one of the commentaries, uh, commenters, um, said something about looking forward compared to looking backward, <laughs> looking back. <laughs> I think that's the key to where we're going and uh, what we need to be doing. And we need to be active about that. And we need to be assertive about that. And we need to be looking for opportunities where we can actually express that opinion. 
so I think the burden's on us uh, more than we think. But I think if we're going to make any change at all, it really is um, on us. Uh, so well said, George. Well said, George. I absolutely agree with that. Right on. So uh, I want to thank everybody for appearing tonight and showing up and hope we all learn something, but hope we all do something uh, going forward. So thank you, Michael. Thank you, Audra. Thank you for the Green Party. And uh, thank everyone. Thanks, everyone. Appreciate it. Thank you, everyone. Have a good evening. Likewise. Take thank, care. Thank you, Mike. Thank you, Mike. Okay. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Save the chat. I can see the chat. Thank you.